Hey everybody, uh, I'm hoping this is recording. Welcome to my basement office in Silver Spring, Maryland. I um, thank you guys for rolling with the punches here and uh, doing our instructional continuity. My kids are upstairs while it's snowing because their school is delayed. So we're going to do a short video lecture on historical materialism. Uh, and then uh, I'm going to send you guys instructions to do a laptop exercise that will trace out um, some of the connections of our own hilltop location at Georgetown um, across time and then also synchronically in the moment. So I'll talk about that at the end, an intimacy mapping project uh, that you will do on your laptops. But for now, I'm going to say a little bit about what historical materialism is. Um, I'm kind of winging it here, but I'm hoping it will work. Um, this should last only about, let's say, 10 minutes. We'll try for that. Um, Okay, so what is historical materialism? Um, why do we care? Why are we talking about it in an English class? Um, we started um, earlier this semester, we read Marx, and we read Marx on the commodity, and when Marx talks about the commodity, he talks about the social relations that are enciphered or coded in the thing that presents itself to you as an object. So remember that this pen is not a pen. This pen is a, the congealed relations of all the human beings and resources that have come to bear in order to bring this pen to us at this moment. So do you remember this story? This is the way in which Marx is telling us a ghost story, that human beings and their labor are encoded or enciphered. Those are all of his words, um, congealed, crystallized, brought together, and made physical in an object. So that's Marx on the commodity. Um, but that's only part of what Marx is doing, and Raymond Williams this week is telling us a little bit more about the story and also poking his finger in a couple of the parts of Marx that Marx doesn't himself theorize um, as explicitly as we want. So first of all, I want to give you guys a definition of historical materialism and what we mean by materialism in general. Um, what you think and what you talk about when you go home for Thanksgiving, um, as many of you will very soon, um, if you are talking about ideas and you're talking about history, what most people think is that you hear this all the time on TV and in books and everywhere and in high school history classes is that ideas change history. So um, the founding fathers dreamed up liberty or the French Revolution imagined freedom and the idea of freedom swept across the world and changed the world. That is idealist history because it imagines that ideas change the world. And what materialism does is turn that entire equation around um, magically and importantly, I think, for us um, by saying that in fact, history is what creates and changes ideas. So that for Marx and the materialists that we're talking about today, the physical and social relations of material bodies, that's history, that creates ideation, culture, the entire apparatus that we think of as ideas. I'm having some coffee now. Um, so this is a total switcheroo. This changes everything because what it says is that, um, remember when we talked about hermeneutics and we talked about etiology, symptoms and causes. This means now that all of our social relations and ideas are symptoms of material relations, which are, for Marx and our historical materialists, the base or cause of historical action. So this is an enormous switch, and what it means is that over, that capitalism, which is a mode of production, which I'll talk about in just a second, um, that capitalism, which is a physical, social, material relation among bodies, as we saw with our pen, that that is going to generate certain forms of ideation or culture including the bourgeois novel, including democracy and the idea of the rule of law, and a whole series of other formations that exist in the realm of ideas. But for Marx and our materialists, that means that those things come from and spring out of a set of material relationships that are historical in nature. You guys get what I'm saying? So remember that the, this is the terminology of base and superstructure. Write that down. The base is the mode of production, the social relationship among individuals in physical, material relations. So in capitalism, 
that's a, one of Marx's modes of production. That is a different mode of production than the earlier one that precedes it, feudalism, which is still a different er, uh, relationship than slavery, the slave mode of production. All of these configure different relationships between the exploiting class and the laboring classes, and those class relations for Marx, I'm paraphrasing for you now, those class relations different in each of those historical configurations is going to generate a different set of cultural and social forms at the level of what he calls the superstructure. So when Williams writes about base and superstructure, he's writing about a kind of two-tiered model where you have physical, social, historical relations down here, and up here is basically everything we think of at the level of ideas. Um, and that ranges from legal forms and political forms like democracy, um, or he'll later say socialism, um, to things like the novel and poetry and art um, and architecture and everything else. And so this bifurcated model suggests for us that everything that lives in the realm of ideas is generated out of the sort of furnace of social relationships among classes. And that's why class struggle for Marx is the motor of history. The physical relations among people change and create ideas, not the other way around. So that's the huge intervention of historical materialism, is to switch this relationship of causality around. So everything at the level of cultural production, art, books, pieces of paper that I put on my wall to pretend like it's art, all of that, these forms that are ideational, are created out of um, the, f the physical social relationships among human beings s stripped and separated into classes. So base and su so Raymond Williams comes in into that model. That's the background. That was hard enough. But that's the background to Raymond Williams' intervention, which is to say, boy, this is actually really strange, Marx, because you have this idea of base down here, which is politics and history, and superstructure up here, which is all of culture and, and all of like authorized politics in the political sphere that's not economics. So you have this double-tiered model, but that's actually really weird because what we as we saw when you as we all saw when we went to special collections, and when we've seen we've seen these um, when we talk about the physical form of media, for example, I mean this is material too, right? What I'm doing right now, um, albeit strangely um, mediated, talking to you guys on the internet, is physical too in a certain way. It's happening over physical infrastructures and digital channels, and there's a whole set of protocols um, that Lisa Gittleman and others would help us understand, like make what we're doing not immaterial or idealist, but actually like physical in a certain way. So Williams comes back and says, boy, this relationship between base and superstructure is a kind of vulgar model. So this term, if you've ever heard the term vulgar Marxism, it refers to the idea that this is a kind of like pretty, pretty basic and um, unsophisticated way of thinking about the difference between um, cultural forms and political forms. And what we need, Williams says, is a more sophisticated account of mediation which is the way in which physical, historical relationships generate and sustain ideal, ideal um, concepts, ideas, things that are happening in the realm of culture. So what, as his, one of his famous books says, what's the relationship between culture and materialism? As he says in the chapters on determination and from reflection to mediation, uh, which are very difficult because they're trying to fuss and complicate this relation, William says they're really complicated. They're reciprocal, so that we have always, and we can see this in the case of political manifestos like Marx's own writing, the Communist Manifesto, for example, that things that are ideas do actually become material in a certain way and change the material sphere. So for Williams, this is like a complication of the sort of monocausal model um, by which material relations create ideas. The point for us is that we're getting a sort of sophisticated model 
of the way that physical, economic, and political relations create and sustain cultural ideas. And so for us, that's why this matters to us when we're talking about culture and literature and the history of literary and aesthetic forms. Because those, for, for a Marxian, a Marxist like um, Raymond Williams, um, even a non-vulgar one like Williams, these, this means that the history of cultural production is a kind of code or cipher or um, congealment, really, of social relations. Um, and that means that looking at culture can tell us about the history of lived experience of real people in a mediated, um, altered, aestheticized way. And so our work as readers of those things, so says this Marxist hermeneutics, is that we have to take the symptom which is the cultural expression, and read back through it to find the cause, which is a kind of historical relation. Um, so I want us to kind of like, that's a lot to give it you guys right now, um, and we're going to come back to it, but I want to kind of, what I want to emphasize is first this sort of monocausal model that Marx gives us, which is vulgar Marxism, base superstructure. And when Williams comes back and says, actually, the superstructure can speak back to the base. So when we write, when we, cultural interventions become material, if you all read a book or watch a movie and then congeal together in the public sphere and create um, a disruption of the normal operations of political or economic life, if you all go on strike because you watch a video, that means that culture has come back and altered, if just slightly, the material basis of social relations. So this is why Williams advances on Marx by giving us a theory of mediation um, between those two spheres. That's historical materialism in 12 minutes, um, and we're going to come back to it. It's complicated. It's very difficult. Williams, this is my old copy of Williams, he writes really beautifully and lucidly, I think, but the ideas here presume a lot of knowledge about Marxism that we need to fill in for ourselves. So we'll come back to that. And what I would like to give you guys now um, to close this short video um, is an assignment. And what I want you guys to do is to take your laptops. And what we're going to try to do is to create a kind of map of what Lisa Lowe next week will call intimacies. And we could call them following Marx and Williams relations. And so what I'm hoping we can do, and I'm going to email you with more specific um, concrete instructions about this, but your job is to make one of two kinds of maps of relations. One of them is a synchronic map. This is a kind of what we would call an interspecies ethnography of the present moment. What are the relationships that create and sustain our being here now? So that would include, for that would be like thinking of ourselves as the pen. How are we at the center of a whole set of different scales of relation? That might include, for me, um, it could include the people who built this house and decided to put a basement in it. It could include, include the people that lived, um, that um, it could include the people that made my shirt the people that designed the software to make the video. It could include all the different things that create the present moment now. It could include, include the microbes that live in my gut and create my gut biome that, as studies show, actually alter the way that I, my brain, those allegedly separate things, are able to operate. So all of that is a kind of interspecies assemblage in the present moment that helps me be the thing that I am. So what we're trying to do in one half of the assignment is create a synchronic map of relations that create you now. The other one, and this is the other option, and I'll write this out in our letter that I'm going to send you, is a diachronic map of relations, a historical ribbon of relations, more in the way in the um, style that we saw Christina Sharp talking about in the wake. What are the historical relations extending over time on different time scales? Um, that bring you here now. So this is a kind of riff on Maguire's work here, which is again a diachronic map of relations in a single place. And we're going to make one of those that's at showing all the nested time scales and relations that bring us to this present moment now. And on the other hand, a synchronic one that suggest that tries, it's going to always be provisional, 
to give us a sense of the different scales of relation that bring us here now. Some of those will be the ones that interest um, Williams and Marx, which would be political and social. Others will be the ones that interest our eco-critics, which will be chemical, biological, evolutionary, and we're going to try to make those things work together and think about what Lowe next week will call the intimacies of four continents. So that's the assignment. This was a lecture on historical materialism. I'm going to try to upload this now and send it to you. Thank you all for listening. Don't get snowed in uh, too badly, and uh, take it easy and have some cocoa. See you guys on Tuesday.